Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from HSH Nordbank New York Branch and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, the Moynian Group. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Anataris Real Estate, C.B. Richard Ellis, Fremont Investment and Loan, Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, the Engel Berman Group, the Wickhoff Group, Titan Capital. Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. 65 years ago, as opposed to 64 when I met with my friend last week, uh, a guy was born in Manhattan but grew up in Queens. This individual today is the principal senior partner, I'll give you the senior partner, of the Must Development Organization, an organization who has, has developed properties in nearly every borough of the city of New York. I'm very happy to introduce Josh Muss. Nice to say hello. Now Josh, so as you originally told, you were born in 1941 and the, the interesting story was, tell us about your, your, your grandfather. Uh, my grandfather came to America in 1906. But how did he come to America? Well, he came yeah. from Russia through Shanghai, through South Africa, um, each each destination that he arrived at, he waited for his wife and child, and then his wife and two children, and his wife and four children to arrive. And when he finally came to America, they followed him, and uh, they settled in Brooklyn. So they 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 settled in Brooklyn when 1906. Uh, 1906. And, and in 1906, because this year you had your hundredth anniversary, he was a furniture maker. Well, in in, in, in Russia. Uh, he started off as a cabinet maker. Uh, when he arrived in uh, South Africa, he found uh, work working as a contractor building barracks. Uh, and uh, by the time he reached America, he was a builder. Now, the interesting thing, I think you said it was either your father or your grandfather. In those days, they would do what Monday was the start of the week. So tell me what on Monday. Well, I, I, I've. I've suggested as follows, as opposed to today where it takes us years, if not decades, to get approvals. Uh, my grandfather would see a property on Monday, he'd uh, negotiate a price on Tuesday, he'd buy it on Wednesday, and on Thursday he'd back up the horses and start plowing for the foundation. Takes a little longer today. A little bit. Now, so you, you fought, your grandfather was in the building business, and he, he built something called Treasure Island? Uh, yes, uh, it, it was uh, treasure land. It was uh, it was actually the culmination of uh, his years of development. Uh, this was in Bayside, uh, and the project consisted of approximately three thousand homes. Now, th these were built when in the nineteen twenties. In the nineteen twenties. So th these were homes that were built, and, and they were what. By a thousand dollar? No, no, I, 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 several thousand dollars. Uh, they were, uh, I guess you'd call them today, they were the old Cape Cod, like Levittown type houses, uh, but built with brick. Uh, we visited them several times. They're very nice homes. Many of them have been expanded. And then many of these houses, most of the houses you said to me, always built near the subway, where, where the subway was going to be coming close. Well, that, to that was more his style in Brooklyn. Uh, when, when he started off in Brooklyn, he was uh, partners with one of the leading uh, lumber uh, contractors at the time, uh, Bossert, and uh, he discovered that if he anticipated where the subways were heading and he bought land that uh, became an attractive uh, development site. Now, the Depression comes on, 1931. What mm -hmm. happens then? Um, my grandfather uh, struggled. Uh, I think everybody struggled at the time. 
Uh, he kept making a living building houses, uh, but uh, most of the uh, wealth that he had accumulated uh, was frittered away. Now, the, the interesting thing is... You it wasn't frittered, it just got it lost. It got lost. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is that your grandfather <clears throat> he had a number of sons. Yes. Uh, but the, the son who was the most educated son was your dad, was Hyman. Well, yeah, Hyman, Hyman was, um, was educated in many ways. Uh, I, th I think uh, one of his uh, brothers, David, was also an attorney, but Hyman uh, graduated uh, Yeshiva College in 1932. He was the uh, first graduating class of Yeshiva. Uh, he became a, an ordained rabbi and uh, then he became a lawyer. He graduated from Columbia Law School. Now, it's interesting. The war is 1941, uh, and you, you were born in 41, and your father, had, it was the Musk family or what it was, was in the development. And you told me that business was so terrible that your father took a job as, an, as a pulpit rabbi in Patchogue? Well, in the, um, in the 1930s, uh, when he graduated law school, uh, he was looking for his, uh, he was looking to seek his fortune, I guess, which meant to, uh, to support his family. Uh, at the time, the uh, Musk development uh, was not accepting new partners, and uh, the law profession was not doing that well either, and he took a job as a pulpit rabbi in Patchogue, Long Island. So he, he picked up the family. And hey, we moved to Patrick. You moved to Patro. What, what was in Patro at that time? I don't remember. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> I remember seeing uh, Fire Island, I believe, but uh, yeah. uh, I don't remember too much about that okay. time. Okay. Now, in 1951, he, he, he did something different. He stopped building single-family homes, right? Yeah. He, when he, when he, when, after the war, he partnered with one of his brothers. This is your father, uh, Hyman. My father, Hyman. Uh, and uh, there were some developments that included uh, some of his brothers and his father. Uh, in other words, he was accepted into the business. Uh, they built single-family houses, and then in 1951, uh, he built his first major development, an apartment building in Forest Hills. And, and he moved into this? Well, it was the alternative to buying a house. The cash that we were supposed to buy a house, he put into an apartment building. So. The biggest problem is an owner living in the same building. It's, you know, <laughs> it could be a little different. I learned to uh, look at the elevator numbers. Now, you, you told me when you were maybe 13 or 15, uh, <coughs> your, your dad uh, did something at College Point? You were, uh, you were sitting... Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was, uh, I think I was uh, in high school, and I was given a job, and I was uh, given the job to help uh, sell houses in College Point. Uh, he had the uh, bad fortune that the day after they started the development of these houses, the city uh, directly across the street opened a uh, dump. Uh, the housing was difficult to sell. Uh, I would spend uh, Sunday afternoons, uh, very frankly, uh, hoping not for too much business because I was busy listening to the football game. I, I was not a very good developer at the time. You, uh, you, were, you, you were a developer <laughs> in training, but the interesting yeah. thing, you told me that you were, you were destined to follow, you, when you were born, yeah. it was like written in the Talmudic discussion <laughs> that you were, going to, you, were going to, you were going to go to Yeshiva College High School, otherwise known as MTA. Yes. You were then going to go to Yeshiva College. That's correct. Then you were going to follow your father's footsteps by going to Columbia. Correct. But you didn't. You went to Harvard Law School. Okay. And then you were going to go into the business. It was written in stone. And what happened? Um, I guess uh, destiny continued. Uh, uh, after law school, I uh, came in and joined my father, my brother at the time. Did they, have, um, did they have desk space? I think you told me well, there wasn't well, enough space Well, actually, my father and, uh, and Charlie Muss, his older brother, was still, was still together. Uh, my father had a, uh, uh, an office on one side of the, uh, the receptionist, my uncle had on the other, and my brother was in my father's office, and then a third desk was put in for myself. Now, now at that, that was the time that uh, your father built the second building in Forest Hills? Uh, approximately. Uh, the, the, he and Charlie built uh, some apartment buildings in, in, um, in Jackson Heights, and then he went out... Uh, 
uh, Charlie chose not to join him, and they built a second uh, apartment building in Forest Hills. So now you, you're married. You were you were 21 when you when you were married. Yes. And uh, you you say to your dad something interesting. There's something good. They're building a bridge, mm. uh, and maybe with that bridge, pop. Maybe we can do some development in some place called Staten Island. Uh, that's when I read the newspaper in college. I looked at the Times and they talked about building a bridge and I said maybe it's a good idea to seek out some alternatives in Staten Island. So what happened? What'd you do? Uh, well, he did it. He went out to Staten Island. I should have told him about the bridge that was being built to Manhattan, but I chose the bridge to Staten Island. Uh, and uh, he went out and he bought some pioneer properties out in Staten Island. Uh, pioneer properties. Nobody was building there at the time, but uh, uh, I think he had that same uh, instincts that my grandfather had when he was seeking the uh, the, uh, the subway stops in Brooklyn. So you you told me it was a little difficult to get out to Staten Island from Borough Park. Yeah. <laughs> my my first summer, uh, I was interning uh, during my first summer uh, or second summer after uh, law school. Um, we were staying at my in-laws' apartment. Uh, we had a new baby, uh, our oldest daughter. And uh, I would take the bus from uh, Borough Park to Bay Ridge, take the ferry to St. George, take the bus to Victory Boulevard, walk across uh, where the Staten Island Expressway was being built, and uh, go to the first development site that I actually had some involvement with. And you built on a former brewery. That's correct. A, um, it, a was, it, was, it was a brewery that had the uh, Forent sign out since the prohibition. It had never been used. It was not zoned for commercial, but uh, uh, some very smart architect said that sounds like a non-conforming uh, use. Uh, and uh, they got a building permit, uh, knocked off the top four floors of the brewery, and eventually became wall bounds uh, on Manor Road. One of the which, which you still own today. Which we still own today. Uh, now, then you did something uh, in uh, Jamaica? Uh, this, in, in about the early 70s, uh, we, uh, we started doing uh, some successful development by making uh, build-to-suit leases with uh, corporations. We did it with the New York Telephone Company in Jamaica. Uh, we did it with uh, Citibank in Forest Hills, and eventually we did it with uh, uh, Con Edison in uh, Forest Hills as well. Yeah, we'll get to Con Edison oh, okay. in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Now, yeah. you said to me when we met that your dad never liked to use his own money? or No, quite the opposite. Oh, no, right. He used my, his... My dad believed in using his own money. And you? Um, I didn't have any money. <laughs> okay. I used his money. <laughs> no, okay. Now, your dad... Now, I think it, there was a time that things changed. It's 1980. Your dad's 69 years of age and you're 39 years of age. You're ambitious... You want to do things. Dad is saying, "Let me, let me keep it quiet." Right? Well, um, my father's very conservative. Uh, he lived through the depression. He saw the ravages of the depression. Understood what debt will do. Uh, believed in low leverage, and uh, did not believe in partners. Um, uh, if he felt the project was good, you don't want need a partner. If a project's bad, you don't want a partner. Uh, and so I, I figured that the way to do projects that are large, which is always a developer's ambition, is to find projects that don't require a lot of cash. And you go back to Staten Island and you, you do what? Well, we, we uh, found a development that was in trouble. It was a, a development that was, um, uh, that was started by Coffin and Broad, a uh, major uh, national uh, house builder even then, now it's one of the largest. Uh, they had spent 12 years trying to get an approval and uh, we found a way to get the approvals. We partnered with them and eventually we built 1,200 houses. In Staten Island? In Staten Island. And you, in you also, one location. In one location. Yes. Now, you, you also at that time did some other things in Staten Island by the other property at that time? Um, well, you know, we, we uh, my, as I said, we f we, he bought or and eventually we bought uh, different sites. Um, some of them haven't been built yet. Uh, some of them we're working on even today. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two sites, one in St. George and one in, uh, in, in uh, Princess, 
Point, which Princess Bay stand on, uh, which have been under the development process for a total of 65 years. 65 years? Total. Uh, one, one since 1971 and one since about 1973 um, approximately there. We're still now, waiting for some final approvals. Now, what, now, you did certain things. You did something in Austin Street. What, do you, what did you do in Austin Street? Um, Austin Street was, uh, was uh, I would say, was a, a return from Staten Island. We started uh, looking for development opportunities elsewhere. Uh, on Austin Street, the, uh, there was an opportunity to build a, uh, a, uh, the Queen's headquarters for uh, Citibank. And um, we found the location. We negotiated hard. They negotiated harder than I did. And we built the bank uh, building, and we delivered it to them for about $5 a square foot rental. Um, I, I assumed that we would make no money, if, or little, very little money, but eventually we'd be able to develop it to continue the shopping street. Um, their lease would be over approximately 2005. Uh, at the early 90s, when banks were in difficulty, they decided to give up the space and we took it back. Uh, we had planned for the eventuality by actually building lintels across the blank walls on the street, and we developed it into a uh, eighty hundred thousand square foot shopping center, a shopping strip on Austin Street, uh, putting in a Barnes and Noble. Is that where your office is today? No, our office is on Union Turnpike in Queens Boulevard. And when did you Forest build that? Uh, that was built in the, the um, in the early early eighties when interest rates were 20 percent. <laughs> and as you said to me yeah. when we met, uh, the 80s were the best of the times and the worst of times. Uh, well, the, the 80s were interesting. The 80s started off with interest rates at phenomenal uh, levels. Uh, we were building houses then. Uh, we built the office building then. Uh, the, uh, it, there was great difficulty in terms of making things work, but they worked. Uh, people were renting space and people were buying houses. Uh, as the 80s moved along and interest rates dropped, the dramatic consequence of the lower rates really fed a boom. Uh, and that boom lasted through the 80s uh, until, until about 1987. And 1987, the world came to an the, end. The, the, it fell off the side of the cliff. But before that, everybody remembers, I mean, some of my... Uh, my audience uh, and viewers might not, but everybody remembers Grossinger's. <laughs> and, and what do you do up in Grossinger's? I mean, Josh Muss, <laughs> who, who did Staten Island, Queens, uh, and Brooklyn, gets involved with Grossinger's? Um, well, you know, look, everybody has their own fantasies. At the time, uh, uh, we concentrated on the boroughs. Uh, it's hard enough to understand uh, one location and to become good at it, uh, to understand the political issues, the environmental issues, the uh, procedural issues, but uh, I was presented the opportunity to develop housing up at Grossinger's, and we had planned to build something like uh, 2,000 houses. It was very attractive. Uh, we, had we had gone up to Grossinger's as a family. Uh, it was an exciting opportunity, uh, and uh, frankly, everybody who I knew got excited with me. And, and you built and you built eleven model houses, which stand today ready for the rest of the development. And when were these houses built? Uh, nineteen eighty-eight, nineteen eighty-nine, approximately. Yeah, and you know, you, you always tell me you've been with me on my other shows and panels that development takes a long time. In in the in nineteen eighty-three, you, you you went to Flushing, <laughs> and. And, and now, in, in 2006, you're doing something on this property. Tell, tell me about that, because that's an interesting, it's a major property today. Yeah, well, um, actually, uh, I lived in Flushing once upon a time, and so that when I came in seeking for opportunities, I felt um, some sort of kindred spirit. I, I went to the community board and I told them I'm not a carpet beggar, I once lived here. Uh, we saw this is actually an opportunity which stemmed from our relationship with Con Edison. Uh, we had uh, uh, removed them from this site and, and built an office building for them. And I got a call from uh, an entrepreneur who was in China at the time, 
they were seeking an opportunity to build something so that people who may want to get green cards when Hong Kong was taken over from China uh, to move. So it gives a sense of timing. And uh, we located the Con Edison site. We negotiated uh, with Con Edison, and we negotiated to find the location in the College Point Industrial Park. Uh, over a period of six or seven years, we finalized the deal with Con Edison, finalized the deal with the city, uh, built the location for them to move to, and by then the window was closed. The development opportunity of the early 80s no longer presented themselves. So we ripped up our plans and we renovated the buildings and we leased them out for a period of 10 years or 12 years. And today? Well, today we uh, were able to find the opportunity to uh, uh, redevelop the property. It's now under the development. Uh, it'll be a major retail and residential mixed-use site. This is how many acres? It's 14 acres. And you're building about, uh, what, um, how many square feet of retail? <laughs> uh, there'll be a total of over 3 million square feet in the, in this, on the site. 3 uh, million square feet. Yeah. A couple of years of development. You have a Target, <laughs> a Home Depot. And a number of other retailers uh, who have signed and will be signing and ready to sign. And you have uh, about 1,100 apartments you're going to be building there. Yeah, we'll build those uh, two, two buildings at once, and the others will be incremental as the market is driven. And be, you know, but you, you did another deal in Flushing before, a couple of years prior. At yes. the, for, for my audience who are older, <laughs> they will remember there was a chain called EJ Corvettes. That's correct. And what do you do over there? Um, this was another opportunity that, uh, that uh, gave a, uh, we took advantage of. The Corvette store went bust. The store was vacant, and this was right after we finished our project in Forest Hills in the early 80s. So we had a sense that there was a market for office space. Uh, we didn't know what to do with the apartment building. Everybody else knew what to do with the apartment building. They didn't know what to do with the old uh, department store. We were fortunate to find a user. Um, it became a very successful project, uh, and it's probably the only project uh, that we did not personally build. Uh, my grandfather, my father, and we built, have built, uh, um, we figure over 15 million square feet of space, and all of it was built by us. Now, what did you know about owning a hotel <laughs> and, 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 and an office building in Brooklyn? Um, that was also 1983. You know, in, in the 80s, uh, uh, developers were drunk with their own schnapps. They were very uh, heady times. Uh, and we were looking for many things to do, and that was one of them. Um, the Flushing Project was another one, and there were a couple of others. Uh, not all of them saw the light of day. Uh, this was a project which was in downtown Brooklyn. A municipal um, garage site. It was a municipal garage. We saw it as actually an opportunity to build an office building and, by the way, build a hotel. Uh, this took a life of its own. Um, uh, it, uh, it took us from 1983 till 1997 to get into the ground, and I would dare say that every single day we had five or six people working full-time, and it was a very frightening time because the market had gone to pot. Uh, we had started with uh, a major tenant who fell off the table, and then we had another major tenant that fell off the table. Uh, and finally, we were able to secure two tenants, which we securitized the lease and were able to finance the hotel. So you built, how, how large is the office building? Approximately 900,000 square feet. And then you built, I mean, people question, who would a, would a Marriott do well in Brooklyn? <laughs> And wow. you built, at that time, how many rooms was that? Uh, 380 rooms. And it's called the Marriott at the Brooklyn Bridge? The New Bridge. York Marriott at the Brooklyn Bridge. And it didn't do well. It's done very well because this September, I think you opened an addition to that. Yes. We, uh, uh, we built an expansion of additional 280 uh, rooms. And actually, the, uh, the extra rooms were necessary uh, for two reasons. Uh, the good reason is that the occupancy is high and uh, many of the local users were complaining that uh, you built a hotel in Brooklyn but you don't have space for us. Uh, but the other reason was much more practical. 
Uh, the original hotel had a huge amount of public space. It's the third or fourth largest ballroom in the city, and we really didn't have enough hotel rooms to uh, uh, justify the public uh, uh, infrastructure. Now, growing up in Brooklyn, I remember uh, Brighton Beach, which has now become, in many cases, Little Odessa. You, you decided to buy the, the famed Brighton Beach baths. What did you do over there? Um, uh, you know, you, you, I, I, almost, I almost want to give you a half-hour story for any one of these projects. But we don't have that much time. <laughs> uh, my, my cousin uh, had tried to develop it. Uh, at the time, it was four major towers uh, from a standpoint of uh, zoning and from a standpoint of financing in the early 90s. It was not doable. Uh, we negotiated a, 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 uh, an agreement and uh, we have since built 15 uh, separate buildings. It's, uh, and I say this first, maybe my first uh, uh, bold statement is that it may be of its type the nicest project ever built in New York City. It's a beautiful project. And we uh, call it the Oceana. Oceana. It's, uh, they, there used to be a movie theater, the Oceana, right well, across the street. Uh, maybe we stole it from them. Oh, okay. But uh, it's a very well-received project, and uh, we're now on our last and 15th building, perhaps to do a little bit more there. Can you do more there? Uh, actually, we're being encouraged by the city and by some of our residents to build a little bit more. And, and how many apartments are at the Oceana? Uh, we have sold 800 approximately. We're selling our last 50 units. So now, now you got you got the Flushing project. You you open the addition to the hotel. The next generation wants to go into Manhattan. You've never been in Manhattan. Um, I hear rumor that. Uh, the next generation has sought out a couple of sites, but uh, you know we'll see what happens. Manhattan is a, a pretty nice place to, within to which to develop. We'll try it. So you, you've you've done Staten Island. Now, at one time, you even tried to go out to the island, Greenpoint, and other parts <laughs> uh, over there. That was in the '80s. That's when we thought we could do just about anything. Yeah, and uh, we backed off. So, what do you see uh, happening? Uh, there's going to be the, there's the fourth generation right now. You there have sure is. Uh, two of my grandchildren were just bar mitzvahed. So that's the fifth generation? Uh, that's the fifth generation, actually. My fourth generation is taking care of the fifth generation. So, you know, I, I'd love to say, and I think, um, I'm sorry I missed your 100th anniversary this year. <laughs> it was a mistake. I, you know? I know it's a mistake. <laughs> but, Josh, I think uh, you have followed the tradition of Isaac, of Hyman, and you've really, in your own career, have truly become a builder of New York, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure spending time. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from HSH Nordbank New York Branch and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, The Moynian Group. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Anataris Real Estate, C.B. Richard Ellis, Fremont Investment and Loan, Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, the Wickhoff Group, Titan Capital.